Distinguished ladies and gentlemen. So like what he said, uh, we are just looking briefly at uh, big data analytics and its relevance in mining. Um, so briefly, we'll look at what the business challenges are currently as, as we speak. And then also, what are the certain trends in our mining industry? And what is big data at all uh, and earth analytics? What are the opportunities when it comes to big data? And why is it even relevant? We'll look at some few applications in the mining industry and then draw a few conclusions. So I'll be quite brief. I know there's no time, so we'll be very brief. You know, generally, the world now is what they call uh, a VUCA world. Uh, what is happening now is that it is certain that the world is now uncertain. Because every day, things are changing. Prices of commodities are changing. Uh, whatever it is, macroeconomic data, things are changing all around us. And it is not as static as it used to be so many years ago. So things are very volatile, that's what the, 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 the V is. And then things are also uncertain. Even when it's volatile, it's better because you can model it. If it's uncertain, you can't. If there's war, there's hunger, Ebola, you have no clue how to get around it. And then also, things are a bit more complex. You struggle to even connect the dependency between variables here and there. And at times, it can be confusing. And because of what we are in, you know, US dollar goes up, and then all of a sudden, it affects quality prices, and then it goes on and on. So I think that now we live in an environment whereby things cannot be as normal as they used to be. And therefore, our thinking and our orientation should change, even as we move and then go through what is happening around us. Generally, the world coming from it some bit of analysis and looked at demand for metals. What is happening now is I know about 10 years ago, China, there was that demand from China and we saw that boom. Over time, it's flattened a bit. Additionally, what is happening is that people are finding other uses for some of these metals. And so the question comes, so what then happens to us? We continue to invest, invest, and then it gets to a point there's a surplus and no one is taking it up. What we are into, people use it as speculation. We are producing for people, but other sizes as a form of investment, even complicating issues and prices rising here and there. So I think that it's something we need to look at. Secondly, the global workforce. The very experienced people are not very, normally are not very comfortable with the digital things that are coming up. So how then do we manage? You have people who are experienced in the industry, and the young guys who are, coming, who are, not inexper who are also inexperienced, having a bit of awe, who are at ease with using these tools. So how then do we marry? I think someone said that now on board, they are supposed to have some young men on these boards, so that at least there can be that collaboration, and then firms can be a going concern and make decent money. The other is about the influence of government and stakeholders. Resource nationalism. We are not getting the best from the resources. So as a firm, how do you position yourself? It will come up. You know, even Ghana, it has started coming up. We are not getting the best. But it's up to us to see how we can manage and then make the very best of it. Now, I'll just talk briefly about uh, data and information. You know, this part of the world, more often than not, we don't appreciate uh, data or information that much. But I'll just share something small in, on this slide. What do you know call the four eyes? Information. We believe that if you have a wealth of information, you can generate insight for information. What's insight? Someone said that insight is when you open a refrigerator. What do you see? It's not meat or chicken, it's light. What is insight? Light from information. The patterns, the dependencies, the relationship. They will help us do what? Influence the way we do things. And in, in as much as it influences us, it impacts on the, the returns or the value we create for our holders. So it's important that as we work through firms, we have these four eyes at the back of our minds, and it guides the way we do things, which in the end will impact on our firms and generate consistent returns. Now, big data will be very big, big, huge. That's basically huge, that normal machines cannot process anymore. And then they characterized by a number of Vs. They are saying velocity. Now, almost every time, I mean, look at your phone, very small phone, and the things they can download. We are saying that there's so much data 
we can pick on the field, whether it's uh, numbers or images, and then they, they are coming at a force. So they are saying that this data is characterized by velocity. One, you can also look at the other one, which is, uh, which is the volume. Your small phones and the thing it can do now, no longer scan disk or pen drive, just a little phone, the amount of data it can, it can hold. So in terms of volume, it is so huge. And then the third one, a variety. It's either text, it's either videos, whatever it is. The idea is that they are so huge that we've got to make sense or pick insights out of this data. And there are many forms of it, as you can see over there. Others didn't talk about viscosity of data, the flow, how it flows to the right users or the information as and when is, is, is needed. Now let's look at this just a real time, like we said. You know, as, as, as mining companies, we may come across some of these equipment we are using and all that. I mean, those days, you have machines and what you realize is that, I mean, you know, mining is very asset heavy. You use a lot of equipment to drive your decision making process. And you have, you have all these machines there, and then, well, they have sensors to pick certain data, how they are performing. The question is that, how do these machines communicate? So now what we are seeing is that there's another level in terms of making of big data techniques. How do machines communicate? I mean, the Air Force, how, how do I know that the tracks are not idle? How do I know that they are, they are, they are, they are conditioning is proper? It's not like if you have your car, you say that if it covers 5,000 kilometers, I go for servicing. It's no longer preventive maintenance. It's predictive maintenance. I need to understand the conditions of the vehicle, what is wrong with the vehicle, to the extent that my supplier has an appreciation through this data analytics and knows when to come in and replace a spare and not ensure that they are normal, they are long idle time or breakages. And that's what's happening all over the world. I think that these changes are happening for us as companies, we are saying that do not do any revolutionary change. It has to be bits and pieces. But though we are talking about IT, don't forget that it, it involves humans as well. And then it takes time for them to also appreciate as well. Someone made a point concerning because of IT, what is going to happen is that uh, maybe either as humans, we may lose our jobs. So there's, there's that confusion. Should we make use of machines or uh, or should we, should we collaborate? But I keep telling people, uh, we've got into an area by we've got to collaborate with machines. Let the machines do the analysis and let us take the decision. But it comes with a skill to, to interpret what the machine is saying. You know, we've all heard about things like artificial intelligence. Now, what they are providing is no longer artificial. They are even predicting things far better than we humans. So I guess I've been calling it augmented intelligence. So we've got to a point whereby we can't do without machines. They have come to stay. We shouldn't be frightened. They have a part to play. We also have a part to play. And I think that if we know that certain things, when it comes to interpretation, is up to us where we are taking decisions. Machines can't take decisions, but machines can do the analysis for us humans take their decisions. And then decisions become quicker. Uh, you realize that risk become minimized and then you generate needed returns when it comes to making money. Now, like I said, what big take data that is that it helps to make better informed decisions. Why? I want to reduce costs, improve revenue, and let it reflect on the bottom line. That is in terms of profit. So as long as you make use of these tools and you don't do things based on gut feelings, but then they are based on solid data and then analysis, it will impact on the kind of decisions you take. In terms of analytics, it seems the mining industry has to be corrected. Uh, maybe we're a bit late when it comes to it. But when it comes to banking, health, they are way, way, way ahead. Why? Because the customers, most of them, they, they are very diverse, demanding more, and therefore they are always forced to deliver so much unto them. These are some of the few examples. I mean, uh, if you look at uh, in, in agriculture, what they do is that the tractors have senses. And as the senses are going on the fields, what they do is that they can pick in terms of core deals and all other uh, information that will be relevant to decision makers or policy makers. Now, even you realize that even uh, for our cities, uh, most of the time you see the GDPs lagging one year, six months. What is happening now is that what we have tools on a food which sends feeds. So whether it's a car service, you can pick these feeds, it's sent to a central point, 
analysis are done, and data is quite near real. If it's not, it's not real time, it's close to real time. Now, when it comes to data analytics, there are four things that comes to mind. The first one is that we are either doing what we call descriptive analysis. What has happened? That one is not uh, rocket science. We all know we can use our phones to check. So, so in terms of descriptive analysis, it's pretty simple. The other one is sort of diagnostic. Why did it happen? Our production is down because of ABC. It's, it's pretty quite easy. But the third one, predictive analysis. What will happen? We are saying that if you to frame your future, you may not get it 100%, but to a very large extent, you need to frame your future. I, I just want to chip in a bit that the German team 2014 used big data. Muller said that when they met in the semi final, Brazil, he said that, okay, all you have to do is that close should just be on David Lewis. So you realize that Muller always operates from the wings, and then as Lewis was focusing on uh, close, he gets a chance to score. They even said that. 30% of the goals are from free kicks. So it means that any time you're setting distance within the pitch, make sure you don't commit fouls. And I'm just saying it because Manchester City, they're all using big data. There are certain matches that you know the guy had beat, the number of areas he, he can cover. So there are certain matches that you don't even put any player there because they are very good. What's their heart rate? How much distance can they cover on the field? I'm saying this that we've got to the point where by it's not about gut feelings. Decisions we've got to take has to be founded solidly on data, its analysis, and how it impacts our decisions because markets are changing. And then the last one is prescriptive analysis. How do I want the future to be like? You know, those days, those who did a bit of business course, they talk about about SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, threats, opportunities. In the era of the third dimension of time, this is no longer exist. What is the strength today? the next day becomes normal. What is an, uh, an opportunity today becomes a threat. I'll give you a typical example. Join, uh, join mobile money when the banks when the, the banks were happy. Oh, now we have mobile money, MTN, we can partner them. Then the banks, the, the, the mobile company said, no, we want to be a bank. Then all of a sudden, the bank said, no, Bank of Ghana, don't license them. We've got into the area whereby we've got to collaborate. There is no point to fight. It's a big pie. We just have to see what space we have to place within. And then we can take advantage of opportunities all around us. There are many, many tools. IBM has some tools, and there are company tools that can help us. Do you know that even lawyers are in trouble? Now, what happens is that if I have a case, I know the judge. I know his reason of judgment. I know the opposing lawyer. We put it in a system through text mining, you know, mining text. We can know how this judge will behave in terms of, in terms of, uh, in terms of the law. <laughs> Where we are getting to, we shouldn't be afraid. Every, everyone will be affected, every sector. But it's how well we can collaborate and then, and then engage machines. That's where we become dominant. So uh, it's not just the money industry, but everyone will be affected. Even doctors, you go and then you tell, uh, uh, Mr. Watson by IBM, I have a headache. Or is that so you plug in there and it gives you the prescription? And it can be predict better than even the doctor. So that's where we are going. So what we are saying is that we in the mining space, how then can we deploy these resources to take advantage of them? I, I have a few applications. Once we share the slides, a few mining firms that are using it. You, you, you can always look at it. And I'll say that for mining companies, there are three pieces we should be concerned about. The first one is the profit. We are here to make money at the end of the day. We increase our revenue, minimize our cost. In terms of profit, the other one is asset utilization. How well are the assets utilized? Remember we said that mining is an asset intensive industry. How well are these assets utilized? The other P is about the people, be it customers, be it other stakeholders. How well are they being treated? You know now we are talking about uh, sustainable development goals and they are all feeding into whatever we are doing. The third one is the planet. How well are we managing in terms of how we dispose our waste, environmental issues? Now, even with big data, what can happen is that they can even know if a rock will fail. Picking sensors, I mean, they, they, they know the characters of the rock, real-time data, they are, picking, they are picking data and know if a rock will fail or not. Even workers wear headgear, they can pick certain, certain, uh, certain conditions concern the health of the worker, whether he's okay, heat exhaustion. A lot of things are happening, and I'm just hoping that 
maybe there can be some collaboration between industry and academia so that maybe the students that are coming up will now focus on IT related projects that will be very relevant to the mining companies and we believe that they will be in a better position to sponsor some of these research. We are just looking at certain business outcomes we'll get once we employ some of these tools or analysis we are talking about here. Yeah, the, um, there are challenges there. We are saying that, look, when it comes to data, you are dealing with humans. And therefore, you cannot take out the element of humans. Humans are used to the way of doing things for a very long time, and therefore, you can't take them out when it comes to data. So get a buy-in for management, and then uh, and then explain the benefits to them, and then over time, they may come to appreciate it. But in making of big data, we are saying that there are certain business outcomes we expect. We are saying that the question is, how do we integrate the huge asset base we have with, our, with the engineering and then IT? We have all the machines. Engineering, we've done our data, we've done all the analysis, uh, all characteristics. How then do we ensure they are well, all, all integrated so that assets are utilized properly? And we believe that, we believe that if data is used if there's better integration between the three, one, we improve profitability, whether it's a slow failure, whether, whether it's a, <clears throat> an asset failure. If we can predict it way ahead of time, what that means is that we are going to ensure that there are no downtimes. The other one is smart procurement. If you are very much aware of probably certain parts of the vehicle, or, or whether it's a machine that may, 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 may break down, then way ahead of time we could address it and not spend so much money on it. The other one is that you're also going to improve asset availability and the utilization so that you don't have trucks and others being in the queue for a very long time. And then also safety and then security is critical. Like we said, once you are in a position and you have that data about the kind of incident you have on the mine, uh, slow characteristics, these are all things that you can prevent them way ahead from them happening. And, and of course, if you are going to reduce cost, if you are efficient and effective, it goes in a long way to reduce cost. And what I also say lastly is that, like I repeated, we shouldn't be afraid of machines. Machines have come to stay. We either cooperate with them or we go extinct. So, Mr. Chairman, I think I'll just end it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My question is that. There's a fear, which is the real fear, okay. that as technology improves and the use of practical application hand-on, where you need labor, is reduced, what happens to the workforce? It's a real problem, though you have debunked it. We, you've just said we have to appreciate and link it. How do we consummate, making sure that Yes, the technology is there, but we will get it. Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> the problem is, in Ghana, um, the regulatory framework, what are we doing so we can embrace this? If we do not manage the regulatory aspect of how mm. to deal with big data, mm. I think mm. we're going mm. to crash. Mm. Okay. Uh, like we, like Prof just said, uh, what is happening now is that, and it's for all of us, uh, as we, we go through the, the rise in terms of our career, there are certain skills we don't have enough, we've got to develop, switch. It's why we're employed for the job, so whether I'm a geological engineer, uh, mechanical, finance, and then also there's the business side when it comes to money. What is my understanding of commercial awareness? What is the impact? Uh, what, 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 what will my actions impact as a business? And there is also the leadership skills and communication. What I'll say is that there's a saying that know something about everything and everything about something. So we are, we, we've gotten to a point whereby the way the world is changing and at a very fast pace, we can't continue to do things the way we are doing. The threat is there. It's up to us to minimize it. So you probably have engineers who are now uh, business analysts, engineers who, who, who are manning key, key positions, and not just because of their technical skills, but they also have serious business skills. They have that commercial awareness about the environment they're operating and how, uh, I mean, in terms of the industry, what drives cost, 
what drives waste, what drives revenue. So all we are saying is that it's true. Some of the jobs may be affected. There's no doubt about it. But as, as, a, as, as, a, as an employee, what, what I've got to do is that how am I also building my skill set, ensuring that I could respond appropriately when these challenges come up. Don't forget that we said markets are no longer starting. So I've got to be agile and still uh, resilient. So what I'm saying is that let's further enhance our skill set in other areas. Technical is good. Let's go beyond technical and also try and develop our business skills, uh, leadership skills, so that at least we will be current with the times. Let me take an example now. The risk that's happening now is that it's cyber risk. We are talking of IT, IT, IT. What, is the, what are the issues on the table? Cyber risk. I tell people that wherever I find yourself, they are doing two things. Either I'm creating value or I'm protecting it. How do I create value? My strategy, innovation. How do I protect value when it comes to compliance, risk management? So I think that uh, we, should, we should be guided and uh, appreciate the happenings around us so that at least will always be very relevant and important to our various steps and then always be up to date. The other one, you know there's a Data Protection Act now. There is. I want to find out what, how many of us has attended any of their gatherings, meetings, sharing with us what it's all about. And so I think that the discussion has started. It started. Uh, but you know, in a part of the world, uh, when it comes to data, most, more often than not, uh, we are not doing well compared to those outside. So like you rightly said, it's about data. And we write to you and then it's, it's a whole issue. Some raise the issue about trust. But I believe that uh, we may have to use laws to ensure that, I mean, some raise about the fact that it will be encrypted, it gives us that level of confidence, it won't be shared with third parties. So I think that uh, the, the data protection unit should do more campaigns when it comes to these things. I know it's out there. Not many of us, I'm sure, are very much conversant with it. So I'm sure the more campaigns they do, then the more we have an appreciation of the relevance of data and how to impact on our lives.